Hi class, this video is going to walk through correlation and regression in Excel. So we have data in our A and B columns, extroversion and volume. And if you look at the in-class exercise, it explains that Taylor thinks extroverts prefer more external stimulation than introverts. He has participants complete an extroversion scale. Possible scores range from 10 to 50 and listen to one song. Participants are instructed that the song is a control to get everyone in the same mood, so there's a little bit of deception, and they're told to pick their preferred volume for the music, and really that's the dependent variable. So we're going to go through it as a correlation, just see are these associated with each other, but truly Taylor thinks extroverts prefer more external stimulation. So he's saying that this internal trait, this personality characteristic, leads to volume preference, so really a regression would be ultimately what we would end up doing because there's a directionality that's implied there. Now, can we support that given the data, given the way that we've collected it? That's a more philosophical question. You can think about that in research methods. But for our purposes, we're going to walk through it both ways so that you can see how to compute those statistics. So we have extroversion. We have volume in those A and B columns. First, we're going to see how many individuals have complete data. So you'll note that I'm using the formula count ifs. And what that formula is going to do is see how many individuals have some number, right? So when we use greater than, less than, together, it's is there some number, some value in there that is not a character or string value? And we see that there are 40 individuals with complete data. So they have some number in A, some number in B. We're then going to get the mean, and this should not be new to you. So we're just going to say, all right, what is the average from A2 to A41? And we could always scroll down and make sure that that is where the data ends. And we see that that is, in fact, where it ends. So there's 40 people. And then we can say, additionally, what is the average on Y? So that's B2 to B41. And so now we know that the average extroversion score is just below 29, so 28.93. And the average mean on Y is 81.83. Now we're going to do sum of squares XY. To do sum of squares XY, we have to get the product term of the deviations on X and the deviations on Y. So that's where these numbers are coming in. So we have A2, that X score, minus the mean on X. So just like we did deviations before, we're going to drag that down. So now it'll be A3 minus the mean on that, A4 minus the mean on that, all the way down to A41. We could check to make sure that's working correctly. 48 minus J3. Double check that J3 is, in fact, the mean on X. That is where it is. So that's what we want. The next one is deviations on Y. And with deviations on Y, we now have the Y score, 60, which is at B2, minus the mean, which is at J4. We've put a dollar sign in there to tell us stay stationary on J4 as we drag down. And we scroll this down. And we find the deviations on Y. Importantly, we haven't squared those yet because this product term, the deviations for X, Y, is going to require us to multiply the deviations on X by the deviations on Y. This allows some of the numbers to be positive, some of the numbers to be negative, and we talked in the actual lecture video about how that works and how that allows the correlation to be positive or negative depending on the relationship. So if you need a conceptual introduction to that, you can go back to the lecture video. So we're going to drag this down. We have C3 times D3, C4 times D4, all the way down this column. And we should see that the last one is C41 times D41. And then we can add these together. We can sum that E column from E2 to E41. And that's going to give us the sum of squares x, y, really it's not squares, but it is a product term. 
And so a lot of books refer to it as the sum of squares x, y. Now with the square deviations on x, this is what we've been doing all year. So we're just going to take those deviations on x and square it. Do that for each individual's deviation from the mean on x. Same thing for square deviations on y. We're going to take each individual person's deviations from the mean on y, square that deviation, and then we can sum these together. So f2 to f41 gives us square deviations for x and g2 to g41 gives us square deviations on y. I can then use those to get the correlation or the correlation coefficient, in this case r, so it's Pearson's product moment correlation. And the formula for that, if we look here, is going to be the sum of squares x, y divided by the square root of the sum of squares x times the sum of squares y. So we're basically saying the relationship between x and y divided by the variability within x and y, right? So it gives us a proportion of variance that is attributable to the relationship between x and y. And we see that it is relatively high. So those scores can range from negative one, meaning there's a strong negative association, to positive one, meaning there's a strong positive association. If there is no association or no linear association, it should be close to zero. We see that there's a strong positive association here where the correlation coefficient is 0.912. Now, I could double check that I've done this correctly. We always want to know where our scores are coming from, what they mean. But there is a built-in function for correlation. I could say check the correlation for everything A2 to A41 with B2 to B41. And from that, I would see that their correlation coefficient from the built-in equation matches my correlation coefficient. We can then use that correlation coefficient to get T obtained. This allows us to test the significance of that correlation. And we see that the T obtained value is relatively large. We could then compare that to a T critical with n minus two degrees of freedom, because that is the degrees of freedom for a correlation is n minus two, where n is the number of individuals for whom we have scores on both variables. So we have 40 individuals with scores on both variables. And so we can see that what we're doing is we take J9, which is the correlation, so R times the square root of J2, which is N minus two, so that's the degrees of freedom. And then we divide that by the square root of one minus R squared. So that gives us our T obtained, and then we can use that T obtained to see if this is significant. So here, we see that we take J10, that's the T obtained, which is our X for this distribution. And then we look to see, is that significant with N minus two degrees of freedom? We find that we have a relatively small number. So scientific notation, E to the negative 16th means that there are 15 zeros before we get to this one. We can right click that though, format cells if it's a little easier to see that as a number without it being in scientific notation, we could specify a number of decimal places. And we would see that even if we went out to 15 decimal places, it would be zero. So this is less than 0 0.001 is the way that we would report it. For an effect size, we can take R and then square it. And that gives us one effect size. There are also ways to get eta squared from t squared. Um, we're not going to go through all of them, 
but this gives us a sense of the variability that is shared between these two variables. So that gives a quick introduction to doing correlation and then we can also do a regression and I'm doing them in the same video because really most of everything that we need from a calculation standpoint we've already done. In fact you can get t obtained from the regression as well it ends up being identical to the correlation. So we're going to focus on the elements that are kind of new. So we talked about the formula for y prime, y prime being the predicted value. Sometimes you'll see it as y hat where it has a little symbol over the top of it that looks kind of like a triangle or the upper portion of a triangle. So from this we can determine y prime, the predicted y value for certain values of x. And we're going to do that for when x is 10 and when x is 50. 10 and 50 I selected them because those are the highest and lowest possible scores. So that's the min and the max possible scores. Not necessarily the min and the max in our data, although you could use those as well. We're just drawing a straight line. So it really doesn't matter which points you pick exactly because you're going to create a straight line between those two points and you can then see the slope, the relationship, the association between x and y. So for b, we're going to take j5 divided by j6 and a lot of the times it's easier to see well what does that really represent so what we're doing is we're taking the sum of squares x y dividing by the sum of squares x that is going to give us our slope so as we see a change right the relationship from x and y how does that relate to the change across x and so from this we see that for each one point change in X, we see a 1.0867 point change on Y. So there is a positive association. So as X goes up, Y goes up. Y basically goes up one point for every point on X. That would explain why our correlation is so close to one. It's almost a one to one change across that. We also need our Y intercept. So when x is 0, what is y? And we get that by saying take j4, where j4 is the mean on y, and then subtract j15 times j3. j15 is that b, so that's our slope, times the mean on x. So we need the mean on x, the mean on y, and our slope to calculate this. And so we see when extroversion is zero, the predicted volume preference would be about 50 decibels. Doesn't necessarily make sense. Extroversion can never be zero on this scale, but it's something that we need in order to calculate these other values, which do make more sense. What is our expected value, right? If we're doing a road trip with somebody who's highly extroverted, what volume preference should we kind of set it at? And then of course we can tweak it when they get in the car. There's gonna be some individual variability, right? We're not gonna nail it right on. But at the same time, that gives us a good estimate. What volume should we set it at if we're picking up a friend who's highly extroverted? And what volume should we set it at if we're picking up a friend who's not extroverted, who, who's highly introverted? So to calculate this, we are going to now take the information that we have at J15 and J16, and we are going to multiply that by 10, 10 being X. So we say, all right, take the slope at J15, multiply by our X of interest, and that is the number that we provide to the formula. So when X is 10, what do we expect the value on Y will be? And then, of course, we need to add in that intercept. So we're going to add in J16. And then we're going to do the same basic thing for the next, except we just have to change X. So whatever our X of interest is, we change that. The formula stays the same. And we see that if we have a friend in the car who's introverted, highly introverted, probably decibel-wise should be about 61 decibels. If we have a friend who's highly extroverted, 
decibel wise should be 104 decibels. I don't recommend listening to it that way for a long period of time. Anything over 80 decibels for long periods of time, 15, 30 minutes, starts to slowly cause hearing damage. You don't want that. That being said, that might be their volume preference. And of course, this is a point, right? This is an estimate. Just like before, our best estimate, whenever we did a T-test or an ANOVA, was if this person is a man or a woman or if this person is white, our best estimate is the group mean for men, right, if they're a man, or the best estimate is the group mean for white people if they are white. Now it's saying if we know something about their extroversion level, what is our best estimate for their decibel preference, their volume preference? Well, if it is 50, their estimate is 104. There's still variability around that, Right? When we looked at those normal distributions by group, some people were above the mean, some people were below the mean. Some people are going to be above this Y prime estimate, some people are going to be below this Y prime estimate. But as a group, if they are highly extroverted, their volume preference will be somewhere in the neighborhood of just under 105 decibels. And that's the way this formula is working. So it's very similar to everything that we've done up until this point.